Medical Research Council is celebrating its centenary as a publicly funded organisation dedicated to providing evidence-based solutions for improving human health. Research to improve human health has long had international significance and the Medical Research Council's extensive health research activities are directed towards delivering medical benefit to people both in the UK and worldwide. Improving human health around the world demands a global response and the Medical Research Council plays an important role in devising and supporting strategic international collaboration. Part of the MRC's strategic plan is to enable researchers to collaborate and form partnerships across the globe. We work with funding partners in government and public and private sectors to support new opportunities for delivering high-impact research. The MRC was created as part of visionary legislation to provide social support for insured workers. The vision included the idea that one penny per year from each insured worker would be put aside for research uh, and a medical research committee was formed in 1913 to decide how to spend that money. During the First World War, the MRC worked very much on war-related issues, including stress, infection and shock. A key issue at the time was research on tuberculosis. However, significant progress in developing treatments for TB had to wait until the 1940s. Two advances led to improvements in the outlook for patients with TB. The first, and I think most important, was the development by the MRC of the randomised controlled trial, because without that, we would never have found a treatment for tuberculosis. Obviously, the other key development was uh, at Rutgers University uh, in the USA was the isolation of the key drug, streptomycin. Collaboration is a key theme running through the work of the MRC over the last 100 years. The 1918 influenza pandemic was the worst the world had ever seen, with an estimated 50 million people dying. That's probably about 2% of the world's population. At that time, they didn't know it was a virus, and work by the Medical Research Council here at Mill Hill uh, showed in 1933 that the, it was a virus and it was able to be propagated. In, in the late 1940s, a network of laboratories uh, around the world, maybe a, a dozen or so laboratories, that's now developed, sponsored by WHO, into a network of labs and 141 national WHO national influenza centres. Uh, present in 111 United Nations member states. Well, the international collaboration now works hugely more efficiently with, with respect to information about the virus. For example, with this H7N9 virus or the 2009 uh, swine flu pandemic, we knew all the character genetic characteristics of the virus within a day. And so that comes out of international collaboration and rapid and free exchange of information to allow a public health response to be initiated. Penicillin was one of those accidents of history, but in 1929 its full potential was not realised. It was only till the 1930s that what was realised was that here we had an agent that could kill bacteria. And that agent had to be made more stable. It had to then be scaled up and mass produced and shown to be effective in clinical practice. But it took collaboration across the Atlantic between the United States and Britain. It took the collaboration of industry engaging with uh, government and federal funders. It's a great testimony to collaboration between Britain and the United States and between the MRC and industry. In 1946, the UK's first cohort study established the importance of cohorts for population-based studies. It also highlighted the importance of studying health issues in different populations and in appropriate local contexts. Within a decade, the MRC began establishing its research agenda outside Europe, establishing units in the Gambia, Jamaica and Uganda.
1947, with injection of a lot of money from the British Colonial Office, the Medical Research Council unit decided to develop permanent sites and cease from sending scientists from the UK on short-term visits. The Gambia unit was a beneficiary of this cash inflow and the unit was established in Fajara by converting an old military hospital into a research centre. The Gambia unit also benefited from the presence of Keneba, a rural village which provided the opportunity not only for population studies but for clinical trials as well. The focus of the unit's research has been on infectious diseases and malaria is almost synonymous with the Gambia unit. The uh, establishment that impregnated bed nets can reduce deaths from malaria by up to 63% remains one of our key findings for which we are well known. The context was post-World War II, the Caribbean, and in fact post-World War II, Sub-Saharan Africa, where a very high and unacceptably high mortality rate in children attributable to malnutrition was noted. And in 1945, the British government sent John Waterloo, who became the first director of the TMRU when it was formed, to report on, to examine and report on the causes of why so many children were dying. In 1954, he asked the MRC whether or not they would set up a unit specifically to look at severe acute malnutrition, its underlying causes, and to use the results from such experiments and, and clinical examinations into improved treatment. There's a great deal about the metabolic, physiologic and pathologic basis of malnutrition has been described and a lot of the work has gone into best practice manuals and importantly the mortality rate has fallen from maybe 35% to 5%. In the early days, uh, when the Uganda unit first opened, in fact, they were very instrumental in setting the map out, actually, of, of, of what HIV and AIDS was doing in Africa. Shortly after that, we got the first treatment started coming to Africa. And there we were asking questions which were <clears throat> not so much, does the drugs work, because we knew that from the north, but how best to use those drugs in the setting in Africa where you're treating millions. And that was the birth of the DART trial, which was a very large trial, um, looking at the need for doing monitoring tests, blood tests, for both side effects and for how well the drugs work. Building on the pioneering work of Professor James Watson and Dr. Francis Crick in the 1950s and Dr. Frederick Sanger in the 1970s, UK and US researchers finished sequencing the C. elegans genome in 1998. This was the first complete sequence of a multicellular organism. The achievement launched an extensive international project. The aim was to establish the DNA sequence of the entire human genome which was completed in 2003. International collaboration in genetics and genomics has changed massively since I, since I started. So when I was um, first training in genetics, it was all about the race to find the gene, and there was little collaboration. If you like, the field became collaborative out of, out of necessity and out of you know, funding organisations uh, like the MRC and NIH, realising that um, you know, that they would only fund research that was, was going to get meaningful results and in this case it had to be collaborative research. Uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy is the most common genetic form of muscular dystrophy. First described by Duchenne, so we call it DMD. And in the early 1980s, when I was funded by the MRC, we knew that this affected boys only, so we knew it was on the X chromosome. Uh, but there was no prenatal test and there was no reliable carrier detection. We did the screening 
uh, for the prenatal diagnosis on the basis of markers which we could isolate. So in the very early 1980s we developed a technique called chromosome sorting so we could get virtually pure X chromosomes in a chest tube, cut them up into little pieces and ask the question which ones of these little pieces uh, was actually co-inherited with the disease. Um, and we identified one in our, uh, of our own in Bob Williamson's lab in London and we collaborated with the Dutch group who also uh, identified another one. And so we had one on each side of the gene, which meant if they, both of those were inherited, the gene in the middle almost certainly was. So we came out with a prenatal test and we tested that through lots of families and sure enough, uh, those two markers were inherited with the disease mutation. And that gave us the, the basis of the prenatal diagnosis and the carrier detection uh, for those families. That so was a very important uh, step forward. Eclampsia is something that happens to women who are pregnant or have just had a baby um, and it's an acute emergency. It's associated with about 10% of maternal deaths around the world and we think around 50,000 women die each year having had an eclamptic convulsion. Well MAGPI was the acronym that stood for Magnesium Sulfate for Prevention of Eclampsia. It came out of a slightly earlier study which showed that Magnesium Sulfate was the treatment of choice for women once they've had this complication. Um, so we recruited in 175 hospitals in 33 countries across four continents. So we recruited in the UK, we recruited in Europe, um, in Africa, in South America, and in India, um, Pakistan, Bangladesh, a range of countries in South Asia. Well, basically we showed that using magnesium sulfate, which is a really uh, simple, low cost um, drug, widely available, um, it's easy for any hospital to manufacture. So we showed that this low, um, relatively low cost drug halved the risk of eclampsia. 100 years after the MRC was founded, their driven and creative researchers remain dedicated to the high impact research to improve human health. The ways of collaborating and available technology may have been unimaginable in 1913, but the importance of collaboration still lies at the heart of many research projects. The Medical Research Council funded me in 2011 to do a PhD project following up 5,000 people across a large community in Kenya. This involves taking £100,000 worth of equipment in two vans and 15 trained staff to operate the equipment. Uh, and this is in 100 different locations, some of which have very poor road access, most of which have no electricity. So the idea was born when I was planning the logistics for this study, that there must be a better way of collecting this kind of data. Um, and it was at that point I realised I used my smartphone for everything. We've managed to create a platform that's smartphone based, which allows a community healthcare worker to reach the most remote of locations on foot and examine someone, giving them a very comprehensive examination. Um, they're able to link that information to experts anywhere in the world who can then read the information, give them feedback about treatment. And the back end is integrated with Google Maps. So if you want to find where 100 people in this location who are blind, for, for example, with cataract, you search, put that into the, into the back end and it populates a Google Map. You can then go out and treat those people. Um, there is clearly a demand for this now. So as, since it became public, we've had interest from over 170 countries to implement it within their healthcare systems, which has been fantastic. International collaboration was crucial to the Human Genome Project. International collaboration will be essential for understanding how genes, environment, interplay to cause disease in an era when anyone can jump on a plane uh, and travel around the world. We must have an international approach and MRC is up for that. So over the next hundred years I think it will be even more important for MRC to collaborate internationally if we're to overcome the disease challenges that we face right across the world.